Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tuan from SG Innovate, and on behalf of our very close friends at the Center for Quantum Technologies, welcome to our event today on quantum computing meets AI and the use cases and the applications on the event. SG Innovate, as some of you may know, we, we see some of the familiar faces who have joined us before. We are set up to help build deep tech innovations. We invest in deep tech startups, we build deep tech talent, and above all, we convene a strong community that focuses on deep tech, AI and data, quantum technology, medical technologies. Uh, this is a special event for us because even though we have had about, I think, seven or eight quantum computing events so far, this is the first one that explores the intersection between quantum computing and AI uh, with some of the insights on current industry use cases. And it is furthermore part one of a two-part series that Dimitris and the team will be introducing to you, and Dimitris will share a bit more about what it is that we are having in store for the second part of this uh, series that will take place in September. Uh, once again, welcome, and without further ado, I would now like to invite Dimitris, Principal Investigator at the Center for Quantum Technologies, to join us and take us through his talk. Could, us, could we give uh, Dimitris a warm round of applause, please? Thank you. Yeah, so apparently, no matter how uh, deep we go, classical technology. we always. Uh, Let me check. Hello. Could you test again? One, two. Hello. Hello. Come down. Hello. 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 Uh, I can be ah. closer. Okay. Can you hear me now? Good. Great. OK, so um, it's great to be back at this nice uh, place um, for maybe third time or so. Uh, this time, we'll go a little bit different. Uh, and it was a challenge, as my group can contest that I hear, to write this talk. Uh, I took a few hours off work because supposed to go a little bit deeper to use cases and not just very general what's quantum computing, but at the same time, it's so, so broad that I would like not to be too technical, to ask questions and stop me at any time. That's the idea of, uh, of the talk today. Um, so without further ado, the general slide, very um, nice and uh, um, maybe good looking, but what does it mean? I'm sure you have seen this before. What does it mean that quantum AI can solve problems in chemistry and energy, material design and so on? I will try to cover this today. Uh, I can talk about everything because it, it will take another 70 slides. I only have 75 slides. Uh, um, but I'll try to focus on chemistry, energy optimization, and a little bit on financial modeling. But the use cases are general. Uh, so let's start. Um, I think uh, there's no pointer, but it's okay. I'll use my. So what's a what's machine learning? Is there any difference? We hear it all the time. Are they the same or they're different? Briefly, what would be the basic to computing? We'll go a little bit fast. Then what are the quantum maps or the use cases? And at the end, what's the hardware? We can talk about uh, um, as much as we want, but if you don't have the hardware, it's all stock. So, AI, probably at least a few experts in AI then 
and myself, so forgive me if I say something not exactly right. Um, but the general picture is that it's a field that had a lot of ups and downs. It started back in the 50s with uh, John McCarthy and the coining of, of the term, followed up by, by the robot, the first robot built at that time, Seiki, a general purpose robot. It could go around a few rooms and navigate itself through the corridors and do very basic operations, very advanced for its time. Um, then Deep Blue, I think this was a critical time when Deep Blue was uh, invented and basically beat Kasparov. I think this, is, this was the spring after another winter. I'll talk about the a, a artificial intelligence windows and, and the low points in the industry. And definitely the vacuum cleaner was a very interesting invention. I was a student at the time. It really helped me keep my room tidy. Um, I don't know if everybody had used these guys that they go around and they move around and they sweep the house. And now we are at the 21st century, da dancing robots, smart machines, smart homes, everything is about advanced autonomous vehicles and so on. So first of all, let's just try to clarify that, that the two notions, AI and machine learning. AI Sorry, the sound is not. AI is about machines that are, can learn and can mimic human behavior, the whole package. They have sensors that they take in the information, then they can process it, and they can make intelligent decisions. Machine learning is a subset. It's about the algorithms. It's about learning and, and without being explicitly programmed. And deep learning is a subset of machine learning, the hottest maybe part recently, which is about deep neural networks and learning kind of in a sense uh, using uh, brain type of approaches. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about this supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Um, just a picture again to put this general difference. AI is much broader. We won't talk too much about AI today. Uh, we'll talk about machine learning and how that can really match quantum programming. But once you go there, of course, everything else is affected. So the windows. AI has a long history of being the next big thing, right? I mean, it's, it's a lot of money being invested at different times. It started in the 50s, 50s then it went down in the 70s. Um, it went up again, new holes around the 80s, down again, late 90s, and now it's kind of exploding again. Uh, the, the, the question is, what's next? We have to be a little bit careful well, as any other technology. Um, things have been tough, especially back in the 70s. There was uh, this language translators based on AI and you would go and say, you would put something like, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You translate to Russian and then back, and it would go, the vodka is good, but the meat is rotten. So, you know, it was not always easy. But we're a long way from that. What we have now, we have Sophia. Um, the talk is short, so I didn't have time to maybe download some um, videos and show you, but it's, it's one of the most advanced examples of integrated AI at the robotic sense. It can talk, it can, ar it can argue, it can have intelligent conversation to a specific degree. And why is that? I mean, Siri, of course, everybody is using a Mac, will have it. The major difference is that now we have data to train it. Back in the 70s, 
That no, was not the case in the 80s. And on top, we have computing power to process everything. This is a very, very simple but very deep um, reasons why, and of course, we have very lots of smart computer scientists that work in the area. Um, projected uh, interest and investment, according to Atos, um, they believe that it will go up and it won't saturate or it won't crash. Uh, I, w I will not take a, a stand on this. I think there's a lot of room to grow. Um, but before we get to that, let me just close one possible question because I get this sometimes when I talk about these things before we move into the quantum part. Is AI a threat to human? Are we going to reach the singularity of quantum computers and so on? Judgment day. I want just to clarify this, my personal opinion at least. Um, I don't believe so. Um, I think we have much more worrying things to occupy our brains, including climate change, ethic of business, world peace and politics, especially in our region and worldwide, rather than worrying about robots that uh, you know, will take over humanity. And as um, a friend once mentioned to me, when we understood flight, we didn't start making bread. So it's a different thing. I don't believe really that this is the main point of discussion nowadays, although you might hear it in some blogs and so on. So let's move on from, the, from this. Um, machine learning, again, for the non-specialists, I'm non-specialist uh, non in the classical um, computing science, of course, but a general kind of picture one can have in mind is that you have three categories. You have unsupervised, supervised, and reinforcement. Um, examples of supervised is our spam filter. You know, it lands. You saw it, a few emails that are spam, and then it, it knows how to control the new incoming ones. Unsupervised is when there's no labels, there's no training data. And the reinforcement is when you learn by experience. We'll talk a little bit more about this in one or two slides. Here you have um, the professor or the agent that um, is the expert. The, the data is labeled. They have some value or some class. And you can predict based on a set of certain training data. That's supervised learning. It, it comes at different versions. One of the most famous ones is what's called support vector machines. I won't go into details on this. Um, unsupervised, an example is customer behavior. You have data, but they don't have labels, like people buy things, different things at different times. Can you predict the new, the new trend? Um, again, there are different approaches in this case, genetic algorithms, clustering, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, for for this case, and you have the reinforcement learning, which is closer to how we learn as kids as well, which is you observe, you take an action. If the action has some effect, you don't do it if it has a negative effect. If you get a good reaction, you go in that direction. That's kind of very generally. Um, and very roughly, the concept of reinforcement learning. So, um, one last slide on this classical part. Unsupervised and supervised, we discussed. Clustering is you have, let's say, um, this is unsupervised, you have data, you want to put them into three groups. There's no training here, you have to find an optimal algorithm to, to do this. This is what's called the clustering approach. In this case, you have classification. You want to find the optimal hyperplane or the line to distinguish these two uh, sets of data or customers or whatever it is. And the regression is something we learn at school when we try to fit basically a line in some sort of data, optimally uh, uh, find the optimal curve that describes the, the data. 
More recently, the more exciting stuff that you know we hear it in the news and is behind Sophia and, 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 and Siri and Google sets is, is neural networks. Um, what's a neural network? It's an inter interconnected group of nodes that each node basically represents a, a neuron, like in our brains, but it's artificial. It's only zero and one, and this is where it goes. This point as well with the when you learn how to flight works and how birds fly that you don't really make birds. I mean, our, our physical neurons, our biological neurons are much more complex structures. But nevertheless, uh, neural networks have shown huge successes in, in, in doing specific tasks, like recognizing handwritten numbers. You take, let's say, you write numbers down, then you, you feed in the machine, you feed in the network with a few of them. The network can, can train itself. You analyze the picture in pixels. I don't want to go too much details. These are the outputs. It's a zero, it's a one, it's a nine. So once you feed it enough and you train it long enough, it can predict by looking at new data what kind of numbers are those. This can be extended to images, to uh, many different cases, facial recognition, and so on. Um, deep learning, actually, uh, especially the last few years, have really done magnificent things beyond just um, numbers recognition. You can tell, uh, distinguish without really being told where, where this is a dog or a you break the problem into layers, that's the idea, and it's each layer basically learns some part of the, of the structure, the outside, the, the head, the, the hair type, and so on, and then it tells you what it is. Um, amazing applications in um, medicine. It's, it's really mind-boggling when either at the cancer case, but also at x-rays, I've seen this uh, actually almost live. You have an x-ray, you, you, you look at it, you have a, a doctor that you train for 20 years to discover whether there's a tumor there or not. And these guys have managed to show that if you have um, enough samples of x-rays, a machine can actually tell much better with a higher probability than a doctor if that white spot in your lung is a cancer or not. I think this is uh, pretty amazing. But the question is, at what cost? Um, we hear this day especially that there's a big energy cost and environmental cost from deep learning and um, AI facilities. A single data center takes more power than a medium-sized town some of these claims are a bit exaggerated, but it's definitely something there. 17% of the total carbon footprint caught by technology is because of data centers. And of course, there have been some efforts. People have been putting their data centers by the sea and using or putting them in very cold climates to reduce that footprint, but this is a big issue. Which brings us actually to the next point that how long can we really keep up um, will it, to, to have the green line where we get even more, um, we need to be able to keep up the computing power and we need to find a way to deal with, uh, with the energy issue as well. And this is where quantum computing is coming. Basically, very simple, you just cannot build fast computers. It's already saturating. If you look, the blue line is transistors per chip. I did my PhD back in the 2000s with a Pentium 4. Maybe some of you can recognize this. Maybe the younger guys from my group, maybe were in primary school at that time, but uh, now we're already at the scale. You see the points there that they're reaching a plateau. Very simply because we cannot squeeze more transistors at the chip. We are letting the atomic 
scale. At the atomic scale, quantum effects are very they create noise. Another way to see that is that the clock speed is also saturating. And the final, which is connects to this thermal output, we just can't drive the chips faster. Because they simply they cannot get any more power out of them. So what does it mean? Does it mean that computing technology ends and then AI will end as well? And and whoever has invested his money at this one, at the green line, but he gets the red one, goes bust. We want to believe that quantum computing is the answer and can cope with the data growth. The data are growing exponentially. We have smart phones, soon we're gonna have smart homes. Uh, they're already there, but maybe not that widely available. Um, so, but definitely we cannot do it in a classical way. How? Maybe quantum. Quantum, why? Because it's fundamentally a different way of doing computing. It's a different way of doing logic itself. We haven't had such a um, disruptive change in the way we process information since the antikythera mechanism in the, you know, 500 BC. We're talking about entanglement and superposition that has not been explored, it has not been at the disposal of humanity. This is the first time we can actually access this resource. What does it mean? What does it mean to have entanglement and superposition? So for computing, it means that you can do what's called quantum parallelism. You can parallelize at the fundamental level your processes without really you know, doing some sort of probabilistic computation. Nature itself, your quantum processor will do that for you. The vision is you're gonna have enormous power for optimization, and I'll cover one or two cases today, the energy and the financial case. Uh, what is the status? The status is that we don't have quantum computers now that outperform classical computers, but it's, it's very close. We're like 1940s, 1950s of the classical computing industry. At CQT, we are doing work in the theory side, diff on different levels, and also hardware. Um, we're building some, some small scale quantum computers. The, uh, the, the challenge here is to, to scale it up, to go beyond what's called the uh, to achieve quantum advantage or quantum supremacy. The cousins or kind of junior brother of quantum computing in a nice sense is quantum simulators, which are kind of specially built machines that solve specific problems. They are not in general reprogrammable or universal, but they do exist now and they solve um, certain challenges in chemistry, in material science, and in energy domain, and in optimization problems with current state or near-term devices. Um, we're also working in this area. The general structures you're trying to understand, this is a material science example, but there are examples. The, the material is too complex to simulate. You need too much memory, impossible for a, for a, for a classical machine. If you solve that problem, it might allow you to create very low loss transmission lines, save energy when you have a wire made of superconducting material, for example, how you build that. This is something that quantum simulators can do. Okay, the interest in quantum computing, uh, I did my PhD 15 years ago. At that time, um, like in the mid 2000s, there was zero uh, software companies in quantum computing. There was, D-Wave was there, one of the early hardware machines, and Google and Microsoft were entering the game. Um, then four years later, things started popping up, uh, both in hardware and software. And now we are kind of uh, in, in a point where we have probably every day at least one startup or um, 
spin-off. Also in CQT, we have three or four. Some guys are here. Um, I see Tomas up there from Entropica. Um, and in my group, we're also setting up something in the software side. Um, so I should mention here that except the private sector, there's the public sector, government are putting in money, big time in quantum. For, ba for a basic science field, uh, it's, it's, it's extremely uh, mind-boggling that uh, this is happening. Multi-billion uh, dollars or euros in different uh, parts of the world, including Singapore. Singapore was one of the early investors. Actually, that Center for Quantum Technologies was the first center called Center for Quantum Technologies worldwide 12 years ago. And now the ecosystem has grown a lot. There are many places in Singapore you can do quantum research, different universities, different institutions. And this is a question these days, what's next? Um, and I hear that in Thailand as well, things are moving on and in different areas, it's public foundations for quantum computing. Um, so quantum computing in five minutes. So this part, you might have heard, who was here last time in my talk? Okay, okay, good. So the rest have not seen this. So I'll, um, so anybody that contemplates quantum mechanics, these are two kind of uh, statements I think are important. Without getting dizzy, does not understand this, Niels Bohr, the father of quantum mechanics. And Richard Feynman, I like his more because he kind of fits with my experience 20 years in the field, you just don't understand it. It's just too exotic. It's, it's crazy. You just get used to it because it explains experiments and describes the world. There has not been a single physics experiment that has not verified quantum mechanics the last 150 years. So let's do a virtual experiment, the double slit experiment to get the idea of, of uh, quantum superposition. We, we have some sort of I don't like the picture, I want to change this these days, but something that sends bullets or balls, they go through two holes, you have the screen, and what you do, you register where most of the bullets will land at the screen. They will land behind the hole, right? I mean, most of them will go straight, uh, this is a distribution behind the open hole. If you close the hole, and open the other one, and then they, most of them will land here. That's a natural experiment, right? That's what you would expect with particles. If you do that with waves, if I have a surface of water, I have some sort of, of, of barrier. Now I close one hole again, water goes, hits the hole, it diffracts, and most of the energy, the wave energy, lands at the place just across the hole. Ev I'm sure everybody has thrown a, a stone in a, a lake, I've seen this, right? If you do the same thing now, but with two holes open, what you see that at the end, at the coast or something, there are points where the wave energy cancels each other and they don't move at all. And there are some other points that you get oscillation. Waves interfere. That's a wave phenomenon, right? We understand that as well. You do the same experiment with electrons using, I don't know if anybody of you remember these old TVs, maybe the more senior of the audience. We have this tube, the electrons go through. Let's send the electrons one by one. They go one by one, they hit the screen, we register where they hit. Here, which is bigger, there was more than one. Here we throw 10 electrons, one by one. Let's do 25, we get this. 100, we get this distribution. But again, the height of the bar says how many electrons landed where. For 1,000, we get this. this is 
how the hell you could get, especially here in the middle, because they go through both holes, almost zero electrons. Why they avoid? They don't want to go there. What's going on? This is exactly like the water waves. These are electrons, right? I mean, we see them when they land, they land in a specific point. They make a little spot at the screen, a fluorescent spot. So what's going on? And they all go one by one. Eh? I'm not sending them all together. I'm sending one, I see where it went, I make a, a, a cross, I send another, and I just make a histogram of the positions. How is that possible? Any ideas? Well, it's the explanation. This is how the nature is. And the only way to, to process it, to accept it, and write mathematical rules that describe it and can predict the behavior and predict future experiments. Now, that's what quantum physics does. And all the future experiments, complicated experiments that led to the technology we have now, semiconductor, classical computers, are based on the superposition principle that particles can be waves and waves can be particles at the same time at the micro scale. Okay, that's fine, but what does this mean in terms of computing? What can I do with this kind of power if I apply it to logic, to, to quantum logic? So let's take two atoms. The electron in one of the atoms is at, we we'll call it zero. The other one in a different orbital, we we'll call it one. Okay, nothing spectacular to this. Anything that has two states can be a, a bit. But now, let's take three of them and encode the number zero, one, one. Again, all classical at this stage. But now, because it's an electron, let me put it in a superposition of zero plus one in two orbitals. This is possible. That's an atomic physics experiment we do all the time. That will mean that the corresponding information bit is also at a zero plus one. And I tried to draw it here with not much success, just to give you the, the point. What does this mean in terms of algorithms? Zero plus one, zero plus one, zero plus one. One way to use this with our classical minds is not how nature is. Nature actually is in this proposition. How many of you see a woman smiling? Raise your hands. And how many see a young lady looking backwards? Okay, so we have 70. How many see both now? Okay, some of you are still protected in one state and some others in the other. Okay, this is just a game with the mind playing with the background, foreground, black, white. But at the microscopic level, this is how nature behaves. Electrons can be at two places at the same time. They can have two values. If they can have two values, what can we do? Let's just take two, zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one, four numbers. We three, Zero, 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 one, and so on. Eight. With five, I have 32 possible With nine, five, 12, 16, 35, 10 to the 10th, roughly four gigs of RAM. 50, 10 to the 15th, corresponds to kind of almost 100 petabytes. 300 more than the number of atoms in the universe. So that's there. This is what nature offers at the macroscopic level. And if that's the case, what can we do with that? Unfortunately, nature offers, but also it uh, makes, makes it more challenging to make it more interesting. To extract that power is not that straightforward. That's why it took us maybe 100,000 years of human evolution to reach this stage. You need to do quantum programming, you need to design quantum algorithms that can exploit that power. And you need to make hardware that is stable enough for these superpositions to be 
alive long enough because naturally they don't want to be there. Naturally they want to collapse. And that's a challenge, but we're getting there. Where are we now? We are at around 30 quantum bits, 20 to 30. I'll talk about the hardware at the end. The supremus or advantage limit is at 50. When you have a kind of a machine that in principle has more memory and more power than a classical machine, does not necessarily solve a useful problem, and that's exactly the challenge, figure out what problems we can use with those machines. And that's a few years away. Most of you might have heard about Searle's algorithm. This is the, the birth of the quantum computing field. He wrote it 20 years ago. He predicted that if you have a quantum computer, you will break crypto systems, you will break classical cryptography. Every time you use your credit card, your PIN is encoded in a large number. So like 15, 3 times 5, 22 times 2 times 5. As the number grows, so much more difficult is to figure out what is the factors. So for classical computers, it's very, very difficult. Quantum computers can do it exponentially fast, according to Shor. So if your number is 400 bits long, you can break it in 10 CPU years, which is basically 9,000 hours in a gigaflop machine with roughly 1,000 qubits, twice as many as classical. You can do it in one hour. You double the number. It was broken in 2009. Go exponentially here, 10 to 2,000. Here you go linearly, five hours. 1,024 bits, this is where we are now. This is what crypto systems are using. That's why we're still safe. You need 100,000 or a million CPU years, 10 hours only with a quantum computer. But the quantum computer, to break this, have at least 4,000 controllable bits, logical bits, qubits, which in some rough connection, that means a million physical ones. And something like a hundred million gates. This is not a short-term killer app. It's very nice, it started the computing, uh, quantum computing field, but we're far from that. Unless, unless you are at that Star Trek, which this is not where we are. We're talking about real technology uh, on Earth, okay? Which is 50 to 100 qubits at the moment, maybe a few hundred the next two, three years. So, so what can you do on Earth with what we have? We have one example, this is one of the top of the range, 70 qubits, not fully optimized yet. If you check kind of the literature, you won't find any scientific publications yet. Most of them are around 20 or 30. This is a Bristol Cone chip by Google, fabricated. It's not benchmarked yet, hopefully soon. What are the near-term use cases or killer apps for this case? What, what can you do? My view, and um, uh, maybe some other people in the field also share this, is a hybrid digital analog classical and quantum approach interface with machine learning. And this is where the AI is coming in now. So that for the rest of the talk, I'll talk a little bit about this. So what I mean by that, quantum computers are very good in producing exotic distributions, exotic probability distributions. Distributions that cannot be generated by classical machines. So you have your quantum hardware in that case, you fill it with some data, you generate the distributions, and then classical optimization, classical um, processing to find the solution. It's a kind of a hybrid approach. These algorithms, this kind of variational algorithms, that can work and solve very useful problems in chemistry, in material science, in machine learning with near-term devices. So I think for the next 
maybe two years or three years, it will be very, uh, we'll see here more and more about that. Um, we are also working um, on this area, both at the research level, but also on applications, on the, what's called the analog approach, where you don't have qubits, but you actually just have an analog version of your quantum system, and you, you use the distributions to do uh, chemistry or machine learning or material science. I can talk to people afterwards if they're interested on the research level on this. So quantum machine learning, four types, depending what algorithm you're using, classical or quantum, and what kind of data you're looking at. Classical data and classical machine learning is here. This is where all this supervised learning, unsupervised reinforcement, anything we know about deep learning lies. Quantum algorithms from classical data, classical data, this is where hope and there are already some results, very exciting results where you can do things much faster and more efficient. You can also have quantum data for classical machine learning. This is a very interesting um, area for science where you use machine learning, classical machine learning to process data instead of having a PhD student, let's say, at the experiment that you do an experiment and something goes wrong and then he goes trying to check it and change the parameters, you get a machine to process that and you can actually process it very efficiently and very fast. Um, not to say that we don't need PhD students, I mean, we should still have PhD students. And this is the quantum data and quantum algorithm case. I will mainly talk about this area. Applications, patterns in classical data, learning distributions, the more exciting ones, and supervised learning. The use cases will be on this. Um, data from sensors, market, stock market, series, bank transactions. Uh, the more exotic, as I said, the more exciting things are. So the catch, as I guess, there's always a catch. That's why now the next few slides will be a little bit, where is the catch, where is the hype, and what's the real stuff? Some exponential algorithms require you to prepare your data in a quantum superposition, requires the machine to read it, and requires what's called a quantum RAM. This is something we don't have. So let's see which ones are the ones do not require this. So, as I said, you can have speed up at the processing, or but the input and readout problem is challenging. How do you feed the data to your quantum computer? How do you read out? Just for the specialists, these are various, I won't go into details to explain each of them. You might have heard about Bayesian interference, classical machines, multiple machines, uh, principal component analysis, there's the quantum version, support vector machines, this is how they, you know, you distinguish this is hyperplane thing. What's the speed up? Where is exponential or quadratic using quantum? Whether you need a quantum RAM or not. Where you see that you need a quantum RAM, things are tough. I mean, we have theory that says, for example, let us take uh, the quantum support ve vector machine. This is basically the optimal hyperplane that distinguishes two sets of data, right? It's a supervised learning problem. So you, you have your data, you train it, and then you can predict where the next point lies here or there. Exponential speed up with quantum subroutine, but you need a quantum RAM. You need to be able to feed in your your data to the machine and in the mouth. This is hard. But if you manage to do that, then you have, yes, you have sh exponential speed up. Let me talk a little bit later on. I will try to talk about the neural networks, the, the, the Boltzmann machines, and the cases where um, one does not need to do this. And this is just basically summarize what I said. Quantum computers are very good in principle to do linear operations, invert matrices, find eigenvalues and eigenvectors, uh, solve linear sets of equations, do Fourier transforms, everything 
of this type is exponentially faster in theory than any classical approach. This is, this is there, this is proven. However, these cases for this specific, for example, the SVM machine requires uh, the notion of feeding the data and reading it out with this stuff, it requires a quantum run. So what can we do that is not so challenging? Now we go to what's called adiabatic and annealing cases. Um, as a Scott Arason has said, this is all very great, but read the fine print. So let's see what works. Uh, I'll present four cases in the next uh, five, ten minutes left, um, which I believe personally they are there's potential for impact in real industries and business. One is the quantum chemistry and material simulations. I discussed this last time, so I won't say much again. Uh, I'm happy to discuss more with you if anybody's interested. Optimization problems for energy and financial portfolio uh, cases. It also maps to shipping lanes and shipping routes, finding optimal. I'll explain what that means. It's a pattern ma matching problem. Recommendation problems, like the Netflix. You have sets of unlabeled data, customer data. Can you predict the new trend? Can you do a recommendation approach? And you have what's called, what, what at least I call, quantum-inspired hybrid algorithms, where you actually um, don't need the hardware. Quantum hardware, you need you are inspired by quantum approaches and people have designed algorithms that work classically and can run in the uh, classical hardware. And so reasonable speed ups, quadratic, sometimes even more speed ups. This one I won't have time to mention and it's also a little bit, um, as I call, a company secret or it's being evolved, but we can talk privately if you're interested. So quantum chemistry. Just a slide that I discussed this last time. Head of super power in the world is spent in chemistry and materials modeling. Designs that can never be done classically are predicted that can be done with a few hundred qubits due to this, this uh, variational approaches. Um, in pharmaceuticals and medical simulations as well. Just an example that if we could build, if we could understand how to reduce the resistance of electricity as they flow through wires, we could cut down by 7%, 6.5% on transmission loss in power lines. That's a big thing. Even a very simple looking problem like ni nitrogen fixation, making fertilizer um, is predicted that if we could simulate the reaction, and not go at 400 Celsius and 200 atmospheres, this is what we do, but do it at room temperature as the bacteria do it, we could actually cut down by 5% the energy required to make fertilizer. These are real predictions and lots of people have been looking at this. Um, we are looking at this as well a little bit on, on material science. Uh, some of this work we've done with the uh, Google group, the Google hardware group, we simulated how electrons behave in the presence of disorder in crystals and how does that affect the conductivity and uh, uh, how can you reduce the losses. I mean, that's be the further down application. That was a research-based approach to understand how disorder works basically in these systems. And it's how they, the, the, the chip we used to simulate those materials looked like there was nine qubits. Um, that was state of the art last year, uh, and it's still actually state of the art in terms of scientific uh, publications. They haven't really been much. They're trying to go to the 30 or 50, but no real papers have been out at the moment. Um, you have superconducting wires. There are nine qubits. You can encode your material science type of Hamiltonian, as we call it, and then run the simulator to, to predict where you have what's called a phase transition in this, in this language. Um, 
So let me go to number two now, which is a little bit, uh, we have not discussed this here very much, optimization problems. Um, quantum machines, based on what's called the annealing approach, can find global minima extremely efficiently. Any combinatoric type of problem, like, let me go to the next slide, the traffic Selenson problem, um, can be solved very efficiently with these machines. We are not very sure if really there is a quantum speed up there or not, but for specific cases, they have shown that there is a very, very interesting so let us take two cases, the energy case and the finance case out of this, and see what this means. So for energy, there is a prediction that um, the consumption is growing about 2.5% per year, I'm gonna reach like 700 quadrillions BTU in, in, in uh, 20 years or so. This is how the OCD countries, or non-OCD, this is China, Russia, uh, it's a real problem. Um, how do you solve it? The prediction is that oil is ending. We have to rely much more on solar and wind power. And the issue is how do you optimize now this? How do you use, these are non-stable, uh, they are not available all the time. Where do you put your generation plot, where do you put your windmills, how far you spread them, what's the optimal configuration to save on transporting electricity where you need it. This is an optimization problem. Um, you have to take into account um, the advantages are there, they are free, but they depend on, on the weather. To set it up, it's expensive compared to maybe more traditional oil-based or gas-based approaches. And you need to store the energy. You need to solve the energy storage problem as well. These are many, many different factors and parameters you need to account when you design what's called a smart grid. When you design a, an energy optimization system, you have your wind energy, solar, hydro, your fuel cells, these are renewable. Then you have your diesel generator. This is a central kind of management unit. You have your storage here. You have your grid. And you need to be able to figure out what's the optimal way to combine all this in order to uh, maximize your output and minimize your costs and waste. This is what's called finding the cost function in these optimization problems. How do you do that? It's a very hard problem for classical computers. Um, you have to take meteorological data in. You, so if you start with some initial design population, I'll put a windmill here, I'll put a battery storage here because the town is here and this is where the, the, the transport will happen and so on. You need to take into account the solar uh, data, rainfall data, the battery model, put it in, evaluate your objective function, this cost function, you know, get out. This part now is usually done classically, but it's very hard. The suggestion is that you can do this using quantum computers much more efficient, and there have been specific results for this. So, in other words, this is what's called the traveling salesman problem. So you have somebody that travels between cities and tries to find the shortest route possible. You have five cities, you have 120 combinations, 30 cities, 10 quadrillion times 10 quadrillion. It's a similar, it's a, it's a mathematically they are equivalent. Um, a simple example, so we understand a little bit the math here, how it maps to quantum. Let's say you have four facilities, factory there, and facility here, third, and you want to distribute them such that transporting the energy around it can be done, pro, pro the production of the transporting can be done in an efficient manner. The optimal locations. If you use what's called a quantum 
optimization approach. You try to find the minimum of this cost function. As we discussed with electrons, as you go down this slope, classically you might hit the local minimum, then you have to go up and then down again, and you might actually get locked here and get a wrong answer. Quantum mechanics allows you to tunnel through and allows you actually to explore the whole landscape and in a parallel manner. Let's just look at specific um, numbers for this. So this is from a recent publication where you have the number of facilities, three facilities, four facilities, and so on. This is the solution. This is the minimal cost function, how much it will cost you to go around. You want to minimize this for the solution for the constraints of the problem. This is how long it took in what's called a Gurubi solver using a single classical CPU machine to find this. The value of the function, whether it was closed. And this is what D-Wave, which is one of these early quantum computing companies, claims they have done. It's quite impressive, actually. Again, it's not clear whether it's still classical annealing or not, but definitely the, the speed and the accuracy of solving these specific problems is quite apparent. As soon as you go to like eight or nine facilities, you have times, um, it blows up from two seconds, goes exponentially to 325 seconds, 42, and here you reach like a 10,000, which was a cutoff limit, whereas the quantum machine just goes linearly, 1,000, 2,000 seconds, after this went down here, and so on, and you get the objective function very, very well, the exact value uh, is here, so it's quite, it's quite impressive actually if you compare these numbers. And this is a real, real use case. People have been, yes? So the nine and 12 is good. The nine? The nine and 12. Yes, the nine you get two, two seconds. Two yes, and then it explodes because it goes. Uh, yes, uh, well sometimes you, you might get trapped in local minima as well, so as you go through, you may not tunnel through enough. It's not always. But uh, what's, what's happening, what's interesting is that you get the value very well even here, and then it goes linear. So, and these are real, real data. So, of course, it has caused a lot of stir in the area. Three months, the Department of Energy has been announcing um, specific kind of programs just for these materials in chemistry and energy simulations um, of the order of $100 million or so to in this area. Very similarly in finance, you have similar problems. I don't have time to go into details, but anything that can be mapped into a combinatorics problem can be solved very efficiently with quantum machines um, and not, it's not easy for classical life. What assets should be included in an optimum portfolio? How should the composition of the portfolio change according to what happens in the market? Opportunities, estimate the risk and the return uh, of a portfolio or a company. So in the similar structure, you have a set of equities, you have a target, cost function, how do you do the allocation? There are different ways, there's this hedging and diversify. I won't go into details, but we can talk a little bit later. I'm running out of time. Um, what you want to be, this is, this is expected return, and this is a volatility. You want to be as, as, as high as possible in terms of, of the return up here, and picking up the specific points here, again, it's a tough problem. It's a problem both that maps to this quadratic optimization, Kubo type of algorithms, and this can be done. How to do that? You have what's called the cons function. It's a complicated, but you can write it down, quadratic one. Then you can use your quantumizing machine or your variational algorithms to find the minimum for this, uh, for this optimization problem. There are many papers in this direction. 
um, that discuss this more and more recently. And the last use case, um, the recommendation problem. This is something I like uh, even more. I mean, not that I don't like the financial world, but you know, it's, uh, it's fun as well. Um, let's say you have kind of a Netflix type of approach. You have users, they've got some movies, some of them like them, some of them they didn't like. And the question is, if we get all this data, this is what Netflix does every evening, right? Collect from hundreds of thousands of users or millions, and then these are unlabeled data. I mean, they don't know what kind of a, of a person you are, right? You, you like adventure movies, you like uh, comedies, these are the labels. Or you like uh, thrillers. The only thing you do is you can, they, they take the data what you watched, and then they try to make a recommendation the next day. And actually, it's pretty, pretty effective. Of course, as the number of users scale and as the number of movies grow, this is a very hard problem. Quantum computers, in this uh, recommendation type of approach, they, they solve this very well as well. We have indications for this. In this case, again, you have data, you have your machine, could be a quantum or classical, where it ends with a quantum case. You have data, but you don't know what kind of probability distribution they follow. You want to learn the probability distribution, the type of, of, of the guy. This is what you want to understand. This is what you can predict, and you want to optimize the distance using a, a variational algorithm. So you can do what's called the neural network Boltzmann machine, a classical Boltzmann machine, or you can do a quantum Boltzmann machine where your nodes are quantum now. And if you do that, you can actually have this exponential growth in the neural network case um, help you to get the distribution much better and in fewer iterations. We've done simulations with this group and also other people have published research papers here. This KL is a mathematical quantity, so how close you get the distribution, your guess compared to what the reality is. The lowest it is, the better it is. Let's look at blue and green. The classical Boltzmann machine after 15 or five iterations gets stuck here, cannot go lower. But quantum actually starts to get it, but it can get much closer. We have, we have specific uh, simulator software to, to play with these things. Don't have a quantum computer at the moment, but we're running this in classical computers, um, where we test this um, cases for real data. Uh, we can plug it in and check how well they do, the quantum machine and the, and the classical machine. This is Python-based stuff we develop in our group. And this one, I won't go through the code. We can discuss a bit more later if you're interested. This is the distribution you want to learn. It's like some data, some customer data, or some uh, whatever um, they came from. Doesn't matter. This is what the classical case guesses. This is what the quantum does. And this is how far uh, from the reality is. Quantum does much better. And if you plot it again, you see that it gets it takes a few more iterations, maybe 15 to 5, but it's much closer, up to 40%. So you guess the probability of what the new customer will like with much higher uh, accuracy. Okay, so last two minutes. Uh, quantum hardware, or how to build the bloody thing and where we are. Well, until now, was software, algorithms, what's the possibilities and what's the potential. Uh, and the race for what's called quantum advantage or quantum supremacy. There are many different technologies, trapped ions and superconducting qubits. Um, at the moment, they're leading the race, but what I want to make clear is we don't really know who's going to win it. It's, it's a fundamentally new approach of doing computation. Uh, maybe something else might come up. At the moment, trapped ions have the maximum and superconductors 
maximum control and configurability degree, and the idea is to push to this regime where you cannot really classically model. You have quantum dots, you have neutral atoms, you have molecules. As you go here, you have more particles, but you have less control. As you go up here, you have less qubits, but more control. Many people are working on this. Uh, roughly, this is more for the specialists, experimentalists. Um, around 20 qubits you can trust to some degree. Uh, anything more than that, it's noisy, it's hard. And again, even that the 20 ones, depending who is telling you what it does, you should check. Um, this is how they look as of 2019. Uh, this is the chip we also kind of, this is the nine qubit chip. There are chips for 20 qubits, but I said they are, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Um, the Riget is a spin-off company from Yale. D-Wave I mentioned earlier. D-Wave claims 2,000 qubit, but it's not really quantum. It's more annealing type of stuff. Still interesting. Ion Q is, is from uh, University of Maryland. We have a few spin-offs in CQT, as I mentioned as well. Intel is pushing on superconducting. And, and the race, where we are, John Martinez a few years ago said, we'll do quantum supremacy in, uh, in a year or two. Still not there. It's a little bit of a challenge because these are very, very hard experiments. But um, person believe it will happen. Whether it will be useful and whether we can really solve a, a real problem is a different question, but we will generate a very big quantum state that cannot be simulated, that's for sure. And uh, that will happen, maybe in the next couple of years. Um, there are many results, there are 20 qubits from IBM, but again, not fully optimized, 72 by Google. This is something we did a couple of years ago, uh, research level um, paper. Um, it remains to be seen. This is how they look, just to get a picture. This is the IBM fridge. You put the, the, this massive kind of sandy layer, it's called inside. You cool it down to minus 273 degrees. This is where quantum effects become apparent. The chip stays at the bottom here, and it's, these are all control lines. Just a picture from the 50s. Uh, this is the ENIAC 1946. It was doing 500 flops. It had 80,000 cubes, 30 tons. We're similar states in terms of hardware. We can do much more than the classical machines, but we are at this stage. Um, I would like to thank the group. This is not only my work, of course, especially Jirava down there, Supernut and Mark, some of them are here. Um, and this is us working on classical mechanics. Uh, and uh, if you want more, check our website or come for a quantum coffee. We have a quantum cafe. You can write to me. Uh, you can ask us for a workshop or you know, learn more about quantum and your business. If you work in classical machine learning, whatever level you are, we're interested to talk to you. We have internships and um, RA positions. And we're also continuously looking for PhD students and postdocs if you are a specialist. Uh, oops. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Happy to take one or two questions if there are any or, yep. Hi, thank you for the talk, very interesting. Can you comment on um, the explainability of a machine learning system um, in quantum terms? Will it add a layer of obfuscation? Uh, in, in quantum terms, what exactly? Like how, how does it converge it or how does it land? Or, or one, one of the big problems we've got these days with machine learning is explainability. Would implementing them in a quantum machine 
obfuscate that. If, if you are asking how they work, why they, how do we know that they do what they do, we don't have a notion of that either in quantum case. It's, a, it's also a, 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 a hidden problem. This is something that would be very interesting to explore at the research level. Yeah. We just know that you, by doing less hidden layers, because you have the quantum space, you can converge and you can get better answers without having to have so many hidden layers because you have quantum. But how does it do? It's the same problem. Thank you. Um, question you were mentioning earlier about uh, some of the challenges on the hardware side, particularly reaching Moore's law on the electron side. How do you see the new research in photonics using photons instead of electrons mm -hmm. to help you uh, in yeah. develop some of the machines and helping the algorithms? Some of the hardware, if I go back to this uh, hardware picture, photons are there actually. People are trying to build quantum computers based on photons. Um, I don't have it here, I should put it. This, it used to be here, somehow it's good. Photons are there. Photons are very good in transporting information. They are not very good when you want to get them to interact. But uh, especially for quantum communication, which is something I didn't discuss very much, except quantum computing, there's also quantum communication, quantum sensing. Quantum communication is a much more, maybe a little developed technology. You can, um, you can build quantum cryptography systems based on photons. Uh, there are one or two uh, major uh, startups that work on photonic quantum computing, like like uh, Xanadu in uh, in, um, uh, in the U.S. and uh, uh, and also research groups. So it remains to be seen. At the moment, the best numbers are in trapped ions and superconductors. But as I said, nobody knows. It could be a hybrid, a photonic superconducting interface that will really do the supremacy benchmarking. We don't know yet. Hi, my name's John. I have a two-part question. Um, you mentioned quantum annealer yeah. versus a quantum computer, a full quantum computer. Uh, I was curious about exactly what the definition of difference is between those two. And the second part, um, you talked about quantum advantage versus quantum supremacy. Mm -hmm. uh, also, just wanted to get a little more clarity around the definition of those. Good. Yeah. So, the quantum annealer is uh, is very specific type of approach where you use your quantum. Um, spin system to find the, the ground state and the ground state, the lowest energy state corresponds to the solution to your combinatorial optimization problem. They are proven they work very well in principle and they have less requirements in, the, in terms of coherence and, and, and nanotechnology compared to this quantum computing circuit model. D-Wave is claiming that they're doing that. It's not very clear what's really quantum annealing or thermal annealing, but they're definitely one of the early benchmarking results that quantum computing can do certain things. The table as always on the, on the annealing. The quantum computing based on the secret model is more universal. When you manage to build the gates and you have four colors, then you can do everything. But that's still not there yet. Now, your second question was about supremacy and advantage. The terms are very close to each other and depends who do you ask. Um, people don't like the supremacy word also for different reasons, and I shared maybe with you in terms of uh, uh, but uh, quantum supremacy, maybe you can say that it's when you reach, you build a quantum uh, state that is very hard to simulate classically, but that's it. And quantum advantage when you can actually do some useful computation on that as well. But the terms are kind of sometimes used interchangeably. Uh, hello, Professor. I want to ask a question. So oh. do you think in the uh, next uh, five to 10 years, quantum computing can be used in our daily life or become a kind of service or computing resource by big companies? Uh, quantum computing is already here. You can go online, you have time, and register on the IBM cloud, and now other people are offering Rigetti. Uh, you can go and, and run your quantum algorithms <laughs> Very basic ones, five qubits are free, 20 qubits cost maybe five or six digits to access at the moment. Um, and then you, you can play with it, do your subroutine there, and then download the stuff and continue your classical computing. I think that model will continue um, and it will expand as well. Most, I don't expect us to change your, don't, don't rush to throw away your classical laptops. 
or your machines, but do both at the corporate level, but also at the, at the individual level, there will be more and more exposure via the cloud. I mean, you won't be able to have a quantum computer at your desk, not in five, not in 10 years, for sure. That's, that's the only thing I can, I don't like betting, but I might bet on, on your desk. But that they, you will be doing a lot of stuff via the cloud that will be quantum, I think it will be there. So do you think that there will be quantum laptops in the future? Yes, but as I said, in the much further <laughs> future. Not, okay. not, 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 but there's no need as well in that sense. Like why, why you need to um, have a quantum laptop if, if, if you could access the machine and do what you want somewhere and that would somehow optimize your cost and, uh, and everybody's kind of <coughs> makes sense. Well, you won't need, need to have it at the, uh, at the portable level. That doesn't hold for other quantum technologies like sensors, for example, that people are working and didn't have time to talk about that you want to have a quantum session on your mobile phone, that they say a very sensitive gravitometer that can navigate without having to be outside and the GPS. People are working in CQT. We also have people building these things. At the moment, you can put them on the trolley and push them around. Uh, you can't put them on your mobile phone yet, but th there, there is a, a use case to develop it. OK, thank you. Hey, hi. Uh, have you seen any use cases related to the blockchain? You already explained about the cryptography, right? The other way of it, right? How do I encrypt my uh, blocks uh, using a quantum computer? Um, this is, uh, I can't, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in blockchain, so I can't really comment. We have people that have been looking at this. Um, I think there are some, some connections, there are some certain approaches that you can break the blockchain and so on, but it's, uh, it's not really something I have worked on myself, so I wouldn't. The second question is on the neural networks built using the yes. quantum, right? It's still on the paper. Uh, when I was reading the challenges in the Google paper, mm -hmm. uh, the main issue is, uh, when the quantum the qubits are not connected, you have something similar to your dying neurons kind of a problem. So that means you have a loss of a data and all that stuff. Uh, does anyone has an advanced research on this particular topic? On, on the, qu the quantum neural networks? Uh, what do you mean dying neurons? You're talking about the biological version? Some of the qubits, uh, as you rightly pointed out, right? They, they, don't, they don't work well. Mm. Sometimes there'll be a loss. We have, we have, we have, yeah, we have the coherence noise. This is the major, uh, <coughs> uh, the major, um, inhibiting factor we don't have quantum computers. The, you put the electron in a superposition, actually in a normal atom, if you put an electron in an excited state, it falls down in yeah. 10 to the minus 12 seconds. This is how uh, it just stays there for a millionth of a millionth of a second. So I if you want to kind of uh, do any kind of operation, there you have two options. Either you do it faster than a millionth of a millionth of a second, which is very, very hard, or you, you find ways to, to keep to keep it protected there and, and it doesn't go here. That's a certain way to do that. Um, that's why we're still at the 40 qubit, 30 right. qubit case. So the, the higher the, the, the scaling, the, the more the issue would be here. Thank you. There was a question uh, there. Okay, um, maybe it's a silly question. Um, I feel like a while ago there was a, a lot of effort around this kind of boson sampling stuff to try and, you know, again, the old boson sampling kind of ah, stuff. Yes, yes. As far, I mean, maybe I'm being unfair here, but as far as I could tell, that was an attempt to make something not especially useful, yes. but to build some state that would be, yes. I think by your terminology, yeah. that would be quantum let's, supremacy, let's, but not advantage. Yeah, yeah. Let, me, let me reiterate the question for everybody and maybe... Sure. I just, the, the question was, are we, are we past that yet? Yeah. There, there is a term here, <laughs> boson sampling. Um, I mean, quantum and AI and all fields are full of term terminology. At the end of the day, things are simple. So boson sampling is another, w it's, it's a very difficult uh, problem, and it's the following. You have lots of channels, lots of waveguides, lots of fibers. You put a photon in, and as those guys, those channels kind of cross to each other, it's very difficult to predict that which channel will come out. So you send a photon in, it kind of um, you know bounces back and forth, and imagine you have like a, it's like a, it's like a labyrinth. You go in in one way, and you have a thousand rooms and a, a thousand doors. Which one are you going to come out? Or if you have a billiard ball, something like this. That's a hard computational problem. Um, it's not clear whether we have been looking at this whether you can. Uh, 
if you have those ensembling in a photonic experiment which you, you're referring to, whether you can solve a useful problem. People have been looking at this now with variational algorithms. That might be the case. And it will be very good because it will really boost the photonic field. Photonic boson sampling is possible to do experimentally. And if it's done and you have enough modes, you have supremacy. But would you have advantages? We said earlier, would you solve something? This is still an open question. follow up on that. So would you consider then a quantum annealer to be a proper or a full quantum computer? Or would you consider it to be not, not really? It's, uh, it's, it's, um, I would say uh, a full, like proper working quantum annealer. First, we have the theory that it's as universal as normal uh, circuit computing. I don't believe what we have now at the experimental level is fully quantum. It's not probably like the D-Wave. We know it has speed ups and it works, but it's not very clear whether it's really quantum there or not. Maybe it's just part quantum, part thermal annealing. But if we build a quantum annealer, at the moment is, until recently, before the variational algorithms were proposed, it was the most closest to reality realization. Now with the variational algorithms, the circuit model has some chances uh, as well. You go variationally, you change the gates, and you do classical optimization until you find a solution. And then you solve chemistry, material science, energy problems. So at the moment, they are both are equally, I think, uh, promising. Yeah? You have not talked about the simplification of the Let me, yeah, as a, yes, yes, I didn't, um, as I mentioned, I didn't, uh, let me see if I have some slide on this. Uh, I stayed, um, yeah, no, I don't have on this talk. Um, quantum technology is not only quantum computing, it's quantum communication and quantum sensing. I mentioned a little bit about sensing. Quantum communication, just for the general audience, means establishing secure communication between distant parties using photons in this case. And this is unbreakable to quantum computers. This is how it was generated. And this is a very developed technology in the sense that we have even done connection via links, satellite links between different continents. There is a plan for Singapore and other countries and so on. Now, there are different approaches there. The quantum repeater is, is one of the challenges. Um, how often you can put, uh, how efficient they are. Uh, I think it's a technological pr problem more than a physics pro problem. So um, I know that certain, certain companies, for example, there's, uh, there's a Swiss company that's been doing this for many years, has certain approaches. Some other people are doing differently. But there is no physical threshold why it should not work. That's good. Okay, so if there are no more questions, thank you for coming.